Hi, Jesse here. We at Wise Solution is building a network to connect resources and people to collaborate for innovations. There are a lot of changes in this year. Digital transformation is sped up because of COVID-19. The bigger contest is AI, automation, IoT, blockchain, 5G, on timeline altogether. So skill gaps, replace workers, and augmented workers is already a focus topic. Although we suddenly need to learn and work remotely, that doesn't mean we know how to do that well with digital tools. Startups put a lot of efforts to solve specific problems, but users and corporate decision makers might have different contexts, priorities, and human resistance they need to consider. The barrier of technology adoption is usually overlooked. So we want to look at the problem with a more complete picture. Here is a manifest that we try to make connections to make it work. No one has the best answer. We intend to exchange different point of views in our panel discussion, including problem solving solutions, how to model human competencies and support better learning and performance, case studies on what works, what enterprises are experimenting and what investors are looking for to catch the market needs, as well as creating social impact. We've seen a lot of great technologies can grow their impact because of lack of funding. And learners are using products with bad design. Corporate training is not efficient, not based on sound science and methodology. Can we change that? On the other hand, I'm also working with IEEE ICICLE. What is ICICLE? We are promoting learning engineering. It's a process and practice that applies the learning sciences and using human-centered engineering design methodologies and data-informed decision-making to support learners and their developments. This sounds idealistic, but ICICLE is an industry connections program. Making connections is the first step to make changes. Here is today's list of panelists and I appreciate their contributions to the conversation, thoughts, feedbacks to further the discussion. So I launched Republic about five years ago to do exactly this, this topic that you've got today is, is very appropriate. I'm gonna switch it up a bit and talk about my case study early on. And the reason for doing that is I want to share a story from the depths of this horrific pandemic that we're having. It's nice to have something exciting to talk about. And this organization that contacted me about three years ago, they had one problem at the time to solve, but they kept getting these light bulb moments when at first they had an IP security issue, meaning that they, they taught classes in a classroom uh, and what they had to do was distribute all their content in print format and people started asking for digital. And when they sent these digital files out, they sent PDFs out, they discovered that their material was being stolen and it was being uh, printed out and resold or distributed electronically. And so their IP security issue was to lock this down. That's why they engaged Republic. But maybe five, six months into it, they discovered a new issue that they could tackle, which was their media spend. All this printed material now, because of the adoption of the digital, was really unnecessary. And then when the pandemic hit, that's when it really sunk in that what they were doing digitally online uh, was able to allow them to sustain their operations. So there are victories around this. We integrated the system to authenticate off of Salesforce in their Blackboard database. So nobody could get to this material unless they were registered. The print spend, because of the amount of students that they have, was about 1.25 million a year. And, and that just stopped. They phased it out over three months. People adopted the digital. They actually stopped requesting print. And so that money went right back into the coffers. And then 
the exciting piece of it is that during this pandemic, from like um, April to June, maybe, we ran some numbers and their students spent about 1.7 million hours in the on-demand classes. They were no longer allowed to meet in the classroom. So it was all on-demand. What is on-demand? In micro-credentialing, we we're working with a number of organizations to, to really refine this, but basically they give a basic overview of the material, text format, maybe some slides, things like that. They present a lecture uh, in video format. This particular one here has got a Spanish version. If you, users click on this, they can watch the lecture in Spanish. And then they can scroll down through slides over here on the right. They get to the next page of it. That's where they could dig in and learn more. Then they start to apply it and they can jump into a lab exercise. The real learning piece of this whole thing, though, where, where most of the learning happens, is after they have consumed all this material, all this spoon-fed stuff, they get online and they start to review it with their peers in the SMEs. So if they had to do a lab exercise or present some topic, they do that and then they get real-time feedback online, not face-to-face, -face, but tremendous amount of learning happens in that space. So the Republic platform that they're using to do this is, it's just that, it's, a, it's an online SaaS platform where they can assemble, host, and distribute content that comes from any type of tools they want. One single source creates adaptive materials to feed the desktop, tablets, mobile. From an access standpoint, content can be public, it be, can be permission-based like we did with the uh, uh, financial people or it could be paid content straight through the uh, platform. Uh, so what the build is, think of it in layers. You could take a PDF from any kind of material or any application you want. That becomes your base layer. And then you start to layer in on top of it, videos and quizzes and surveys and assessments. In our sampler, we're utilizing the typically empty space to the left of the cover page for a bit of branding. As you can see, menus and reading interfaces can carry branding as well. Embed a slideshow or make it play automatically or click at a time. Zoom in for a closer look. Here we are inserting audio to play back as an audio book or perhaps a musical track uh, to the text content. Adding audio to the written content reinforces comprehension and retention. A read-along transcript can be part of the design or a pop-up. You may even have other documents to reference and link them in a pop-up as this PDF shows. This is the original book which our transcript and audio files are based. Since you could design in any application you like, your learning and marketing designs can be far more intricate than typical web pages, for instance. Notice all the shadows and overlays and transparency designed into uh, this to capture and hold your reader's attention. Engage your audience with interactions, the ability to place a quiz, survey, active videos, even games on a page draws your audience in deeper. Answers and responses are easily captured in a database outside of the ebook for sharing and integration with human resources or learning management systems. This widget here lets me drop in a video and place pop-ups and some extra pictures and bookmarks within it. It's placed just like a regular video. The survey, similar to the quiz, drops into place. People answer and the responses go out to an external database. Here we're streaming a YouTube video and what we've done is created a transcript with the slides that go along with the YouTube video presentation and we pop those up here on the left. So as he talks and presents his content, I can read along and I can see the slides that go along with his presentation. This last insert here is another streaming video from YouTube, but it's a 360 degree virtual reality stream. And it could be played in place in the book where I'm navigating and just dragging around, or I could take it out to full screen and put on a set of virtual reality goggles and actually watch and navigate through in 3D space. So back to page one. Now let's look at how we actually build these things. The admin interface 
allows you to insert pages, replace pages. You can see to the right here, we've got a number of different things. We can add audio pages themselves that simply play music or text. Now let's add a link. All right. So what kind of link are we going to add? We're going to add and make it a video. We could click the button and upload a video. Click there, upload an audio. Could be the quiz, the HTMLs. But for this example, let's add a page link. What this is is a page jump. I'll set this to jump to page, say, five. And as soon as I save it, if I go back to our original book, you see that it's not active yet. But as soon as I refresh that book, this link becomes live. I click on it. It jumps me out to page five. Now I can go back to the top. I've got a page jump back to home, which takes me back to the home page. So you questioned about training in the workflow, and I'm kind of running a little bit over, so I'm going to blast through these slides. We're working with Apply Synergies and some other organizations that have monocular uh, wearable technology uh, in order to get content out into the, um, the workspace uh, at, a, at the moment of need, really. That's the whole concept behind these micro-credentials and, and Con Godfordson's uh, uh, methodology. Um, you could watch, you could read, you could listen, whatever is the most convenient for you in that workplace as a connected worker. To be agile and adaptive, that's what we are. I mean, we're a, we're a system that lets you integrate and pull together all kinds of media uh, really at the moment of need. Uh, when you need it. We created a series of quick start guides uh, in the essence of time. Uh, I won't show the little video clip that goes through it, but this quick start guide for taking this Toastmaster organization to online meetings was like a two pager, but it was, we put the Google Docs that they needed for forms right in the couple of pages of this booklet. And we put the meeting uh, link to start their Zoom meetings uh, right in there. And then we collected uh, analytic data to see how it was uh, uh, getting adapted. And it, it made its way at, through Europe and uh, Asia uh, within, gosh, a two or three week period. But that was an overnight transition. So this is just a little uh, list of some of the types of work that uh, we're applying this to. A lot of it, it in the, uh, the medical space and the retraining space with coal field development. So I will end there and I thank you very much for the presentation and look forward to people's feedback. Uh, my name is Konstantin. I'm the CEO and founder of this company, Spiral Technology. We specifically focus on the productivity solutions for aerospace. And we do it with variable technology, with augmented reality. John mentions uh, another company which is doing some what we call assisted reality, but I see that generally speaking and strategically, it's, it's the same direction and this basically logically follows his, uh, his approach. Uh, I start with why, like why we started doing this. This is a typical picture in the maintenance hangar of uh, one of our clients and all of them have this. So much paper is still printed to, uh, to follow basically to support uh, regular day-to-day -day operations and maintenance repair and tra training, resulting training out of it as well. Uh, so we said that that's unfair and this is so 20th century and we, we can do much better. And our thesis about training is a bit controversial. I'm happy to hear your feedback afterwards. But basically what we see, what this technology can do and what we've heard from clients, that they would love to minimize the classroom training and to move it to on the job training as much as possible. So basically this is how we operate with the training thesis. We are not training company per se. We are doing operations, but we believe that we can enable much more efficient training with that. Uh, quick overview of XRs, where, how we look at this, uh, obviously virtual reality is uh, the most mature technology, but in terms of applicability to real operations, it's very low. Uh, there is only set of industrial trainings which you can do. It's effective for pilots. I've been in one of the simulators because it's very costly to fly actual jet and instead of spending an hour, uh, I even have to have numbers. So I think it costs about $100 per hour for, for, to fly. And obviously it's negligible to train on the simulator. Then assisted reality with this um, Android display 
alongside your eyes. It's helpful in certain situations, but we believe that it's, it is still limited because just it's a very small display. And indeed, when you need critical information in front of you in a very uh, confined space, for example, it is uh, helpful. Uh, but we were looking further. So the ne next one is augmented reality on different mobile devices, tablets in particular, also has its disadvantages because you need to hold this tablet in the hands. And this is critical when you need to repair jet engine, for example, this is, this is really making difference because it, it takes time to handle it back and forth. And what we are focusing on is uh, so-called augmented or mixed reality. Uh, an important disclaimer, we're not pitching any specific hardware. We're hardware agnostic, although I do use mixed, uh, I, do, I do use um, Microsoft HoloLens. This is how the device looks like, simply because it's available in the market and it's pretty good, but we'll be more than happy to see more hardware. Uh, specific reasons why AR is better than previously mentioned technologies, uh, they incre it increases your mobility versus tablets because of hands-free. It really increases comprehension with its 3D view. When you put these glasses on, it's almost like in those movies when you're, I, I don't know, Iron Man or a Minority Report, when you're manipulating images, you can walk around 3D shapes. And because we think in 3D, this is where it touches training a lot. It increases the speed how, uh, when speed of students understanding what uh, the functionality of the engine. And the final piece, what we call contextual overlay, it's a longer topic, I, I won't stop long unless you will have questions later. It's a really deep topic which allows uh, super specific and uh, super valuable use cases in manufacturing. Less about training, maybe we just didn't uncover that uh, capabilities, maybe training will feature there as well, but because you can basically project either 3D shapes or uh, technical references on top of the part or equipment, it helps you a lot, and I, I stop here. Uh, let me show you some of the snapshots of the prototypes uh, that we uh, developed uh, with with few aerospace companies. Uh, and again, this is to enable their operations, but this is to, to, to stretch your imagination how you can apply this for training. So this is what person glasses, it's a checklist from of their operations on, on top of real engine. Then you can drill down in uh, every particular component uh, and see, for example, what's the history of past maintenance, when it was installed, calibrated. Here are the pictures of uh, boroscope inspection. It's very specific optical inspection procedure. So you can assess how the damage is evolving and it's, uh, it's all hands-free. And then this is uh, very simplistic, but demonstration of how the disassembly sequence can look like. And this was done as a prototype exactly for training purposes. So you can see the pieces of engine in the right sequence uh, to, to, to train on how you need to disassemble them, what to, do, what to disattach first uh, and what precautions to follow. Then the capability which they followed a lot, uh, valued a lot is that a more senior technician can look over the shoulder, basically looking through uh, the camera of the junior mechanic who is working on the asset. And uh, it's, people call it remote assistance. Uh, it can be used in training as well. Uh, another quick snapshot, uh, this one is made in the uh, Aeron Aerospace University in the US. This is, uh, it has, uh, I'll stop here for a second. It has two purposes. So of course, first one is to increase productivity of their maintenance activities. This is their own fleet. They have X number of aircraft to teach students flying, but they also have mechanical school. And the second use case, which they have in mind, why, will, why wouldn't we teach mechanical engineering with AR? So these are some of their engineers in the glasses. And then next few shots would be the view from the glasses. You see their maintenance manuals, illustrated part catalogs, uh, checklists, uh, then this is, elements of this overlay. So you can create a virtual tag to report non-conformance, for example. If you see a damage on the aircraft, this is what they do today with pen and paper. Instead of that, you can create a, a virtual uh, rec record and put it on, uh, on the digital twin uh, model of particular component. And it can follow the whole life cycle. That's important. The part from being manufactured, you can have a history of that part digitally, uh, which you can access through the glasses. Um, I would rather stop here, I'll make it shorter. I have a few more uh, footage like that. 
I have longer stories, but uh, I, my core message is that training can be moved on the job as much as possible. I like this, ta uh, this title, which Jesse had somewhere in the presentation, uh, learning in the age of immediacy. So I think if more technologies like that would be adopted on the workplace for operations, the training, training will benefit more and more from that. Uh, and I think uh, the platform which John has demonstrated, it can unite, kind of tie, tie these things together. It can, training can still, it will be still in different forms. It will be still in, in the classroom, still on the tablet and on the job but it needs to be a healthy balance and I like how it is all evolving. Um, let me know if you have questions later and this is where I stop, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, I'm improvising here. Um, I know uh, Brendan just joined us and he has to go to his doctor's office. So uh, Brendan is the director of learning at Delta Airlines and, and he is the author of you just mentioned learning in the age of immediacy. So oh. I believe he know <clears throat> all this um, technology and their use. <clears throat> this trend is all moving learning to more learning center, learning on demand and contextualized learning. Uh, but uh, bring this uh, vision down to ground, how to make it happen. Uh, can Brandon talk about your thoughts, Hi, your feedback? Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi I'm here. I'm, I really deeply apologize. I hurt my shoulder yesterday afternoon really bad, and I'm at the doctor's office. And uh, so, I, but I can I can talk right now until they call me in. Uh, okay. I do apologize. <laughs> sure. Uh, but so, yeah, I really appreciated Constantine's presentation. I saw some of it as I dialed in uh, because that's exactly what we're facing at Delta. But COVID really accelerated some of how we do our training because a lot of our training was done in the airports in person, right? And so we had to stop doing a lot of that immediately, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, before you came in, uh, John Costa just uh, introduced his platform is to really also the content, uh, like uh, your uh, traditional content, like a PDF, because there are still a lot of PDF documents, instructional tutorials there, and and uh, all kinds of multimedia together become a mobile learning format. So um, for AR, you need to have the equipment, and for mobile learning, just on your phone. Yeah. So please, um, what do you think about this? How do you implement this? How, what's your consideration when you adopt new solutions? Yeah, I, it's a great question. And, and of course, context matters the most when you think about uh, mobile learning, for example. So I implemented a pretty broad mobile learning platform at Home Depot, which was my uh, where I was prior to Delta. Um, but the general philosophy about that is most workers, especially frontline workers, are mobile you know, and, and in, especially in companies where mobile workers, meaning workers move about during the day doing their job, right? It's, a, it's, it's good if you can move the learning as close to or in the work stream as possible. Some of us think of this as classic performance support in the model that Gloria Gary uh, designed in the 1990s, right? Uh, but what we try to do is look at those moments of need, right? So across all of a worker's moments of needs, where moments of need, where can they gain the information that reinforces uh, a procedure or a process or troubleshooting or some type of activity that they need to complete? So it's less formal learning like the previous person was talking about. It's not necessarily going to replace in-person training or live virtual training. But a mobile uh, experience really is about lifting up at that moment of need the worker's ability to complete the tasks. And so we're doing some of that at Delta. So what we're doing at Delta with mobile learning is around safety. But uh, the, the challenge is when you're working around an aircraft, it's really not possible for you to pause and pull out a mobile phone and do something with it because of safety uh, implications, right? So, so this is a good case of we're bringing uh, 
bringing mobile learning near the work stream. Whereas in Home Depot, we were providing an app on a work device for our retail associates that work in the store. And when they were engaging with customers in an interaction around selling a product in the store, they could leverage the app to help guide them through the interaction with the customer while they were working. At Delta, it's a little different because we want to reinforce safety either before they go on to their shift when they're working around the airplane or after they complete their shift and they come back into the break room. So we have uh, screens available in the, in the break room. And the idea around this is what we call nudging. So we're nudging with short interactions in a game-like environment that reinforce key safety concepts for our workers to uh, engage with before they go to work. And the idea there is a lot of our folks who go out and, and, and work, they're doing repetitious, you know, they're doing repetitive tasks over and over. So here what they, uh, sometimes what they do when they're engaging in repetitive tasks is they inadvertently get into automated behavior and they'll violate a safety rule. And sometimes they don't even know they do it, right? It's kind of how our brain works. And so by reinforcing concepts around uh, not violating safety procedures near, you know, when they're going to be going to work versus having done this in a classroom a day or two ago or an e-learning module six weeks ago, the, the idea of the nudging is to just reinforce these key concepts to, to uh, you know, trick the brain into remembering this, if you will. Um, so we're doing that now in a few of our airports just to try it out to see if there's um, any impact on behavior. We think there will be uh, some impact there uh, with the safety, with, with the safety behavior, if you will. So mobile is really the way to go when you're looking at reinforcing uh, key concepts or, you know, learning that people need to pick up on while they're performing their tasks. It works really great in that context, but we must all remember when we're designing these experiences that we have to be deeply, un we have to understand deeply how the work gets done, not how we think it should get done, but how it actually gets done in the environment that our, our folks are working in. Yeah, so um, the notching, how do you uh, design this notching? Um, you, so the, the you great thing about the sorry. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, you usually actually mention uh, your challenges is the constrained time and resources to make this transformation. And how do you make this transformation? Do you already have this nudging before? No, this is new. This is new to us, and what we're looking for is to devise ways to break down that automated behavior as much as possible. Now, what we want to end up doing is to predict automated behavior. And I was, we were working with um, a gentleman that runs Stanford's um, immersion, human immersion lab. And he was telling us that the way we're nudging before and after the work gets done, like right before it gets done or right after it gets done, oh, yeah. is a move forward, yeah. right? Yeah. But the best thing you want to get to is how do you predict when that automated behavior is going to happen and then nudge the performer at that point so that you can prevent it. So that requires us to have something on the physical body. We want a physical object on the body, like think of an Apple Watch, right, that knows your environment. It knows it knows you're stressed, it can tell you're stressed, it can tell you're in a loud environment, it can tell you're, you're not geocached where you should be, or for example, right, or you're doing something quick, quickly or erratically and it nudges you by a haptics, right? So this is an evolution, if you will. We're, we're just trying to see how can we, you know, before we can actually have something physical on the body, because there's a lot of privacy and work rules that have to come about and be negotiated before mm -hmm. we can do that. How mm -hmm. can we work towards at least reminding and reinforcing these right before the work is done? So we're, we're testing that now in our LA, in our LAX airport, and we're about to test in JFK to mm -hmm. see if there's any behavioral shifts that have any value with this. So the nudges are just really short and they're focused on 
uh, just key parts of working around the aircraft. For example, the one we have now is around engine ingestion, you know, which is uh, a severe safety um, situation where you could literally be ingested yourself or have things ingested into the engine of the airplane if you walk too close to it, those kinds of things, right? So we just reinforce distance and aware, situational awareness and things like that in the short nudges. So, yeah, I know the Stanford professor. I cannot think of his name now. Um, he, he also uh, have a model that the behavior depend on uh, motivation and also knowledge, also ability. So there's an yeah. assessment in, yes. in, in the flow, right? And I, I appreciate the nudging. It is a way toward what we call intelligent workflow or intelligent work stream. That's, exactly. that's happening, yeah. And so- yes, um, his, name is, uh, his name is Jeremy and unfortunately I'm, <laughs> I'm dropped on his last name. He actually is a co-creator of Striver, a co-founder of Striver, which is the VR company. Yes, Balenson, thank you, Jeremy Balenson. I was just talking, to, he's a cognitive psychology psychologist yeah. he co-created striver and he runs stanford's human immersion lab and you, you know he, he he was saying exactly what you're saying jesse i mean the reality is you want to get to predicting that behavior but that's not where we where we are yet although we want to get there yeah so they involve assessment about the learner exactly so so my name is Jody Liss. I think I know most of you. I've been involved with um, the icicle community since almost since the almost the beginning. So it's been super exciting to see the whole transformation, literally, of icicle over the last couple of years, um, and working on all the different areas of how do we define learning engineering as a practice, a process, and a profession. Um, so we've been learning lots of different things along the way and you all have been contributing and we're excited to keep moving that forward. I have a very different perspective from you. I work in very low resource environments. I work uh, mostly in Africa. That's where my work in digital learning has taken place for the last decades. Um, so I wanted to share with you an example um, of a project that I worked on in Zambia. It is actually from my previous employer. So um, up to date, up to like two or three months ago. Um, and I actually presented this at a um, conference, a, a global digital development conference a couple of months ago um, in one of those five minute Ignite lightning talk type things. So mine shouldn't be more than five minutes after once I start talking. Uh, so, like I said, um, it's about engineering learning technology scale in Zambia. For you who don't know Zambia, it's down um, in the eastern part of Africa. And there's, I think, I tried to look up the population. I think it was like 13 million people, something like that. Um, and so the project is about e-learning. And we worked with the Ministry of Health to develop um, e-learning modules um, on some different clinical areas that I'll get to in a second, um, and to be able to do a blended learning approach um, with some uh, health workers. So it was super exciting about this. It started about four years ago. It was last year, the minister of the Ministry of Health basically came out and said, okay, everybody needs to actually take all of these courses that have been developed. So when you have the minister going out to the entire country, to all the health workers to take these courses, you're like, wow, that's a pretty cool thing. So what I want to describe is how we, how we got to that as the project. Um, this is actually the website um, where the courses are. It's a Moodle site um, and there's 11 different courses on it. It was great when I first went to visit Zambia um, in 20. 14, I think it was, yeah. Um, they thought at the end of the two week workshop that they would have, you know, six web courses done, completed, and all that stuff. They were kind of in shock how much work it really takes to do e learning, as you all understand. Um, and two and a half years later, they actually had their first course. Um, but it was just, they were super excited to be able to, to move that forward. Um, so there's 11 courses all together. And currently, um, this has been up now for a good two years. There's 5,000 users on it, which is pretty impressive and pretty exciting. So again, how, what was that process to be able to get there? 
Um, beginning with the end in mind, um, we began actually with the government. And as you can see, the government policy actually has e-learning as part of the policy, which was great because then you already know there was already some buy-in from the government. Uh, at least at the highest possible policy level, at the level of actually implementation is another story, but I'll get to that. But at least that was really fully recognized. Um, in terms of some of the people that were on the team, the staff at the project that I worked on actually had six people working on it, um, uh, from the technology side to the subject matter expert to the implementation side of things. And we actually hired a vendor that managed all the content and also actually subcontracted a Moodle provider in the UK um, to be able to provide that. So the vendor actually handled all the instructional design, all the graphics, um, putting all the content and everything together. So it was just really um, a great thing to have in the beginning that we knew you know, who the people are, where we're going. And as the project progressed, okay, how are we gonna be able to transition it? Um, so like I said, there was these um, 11 modules that have been completed. This module um, has 20 different um, modules within the module. Um, it takes about 11 hours to actually go through the entire module. And so there's 11 of these. So you can pretty imagine how intense everything was. Um, so they knew nothing about instructional design and had to learn from the very beginning of what it really means to design something and come up with the instructional strategies and the learning objectives that would go along with the assessments. Um, so it was, it was great process of being able to be involved with that and you kind of feel like that proud educator at the end that your students, my staff, were able to be able to know how to do instructional design. Um, so super excited about that. The subject people, the ministry folks, the academic folks really got um, excited and even did some of the voicing for some of these different modules. So it really, really took off in terms of um, how it's being used. They developed all these graphics, hundreds and hundreds of different graphics to really contextualize it and make it all happen. Um, so the process, as I mentioned, it was more of a, it was a blended learning approach. Um, people got together to train the mentors um, who were the health providers um, at a you know, higher level to work with the health providers at the facility level. So they learned how to do the e-learning. Um, the learners would receive on-site mentorship. Um, so it was both, again, at that time, of course, this was pre-COVID, that they would visit the facilities. Um, and then the, the learners, the health providers would take the e-learning courses. And it's similar to what um, you know, Brandon kind of just described. Um, you're trying to do the learning while it's performing and bring it to closer to where it's all happening. Um, and in addition to using as e-learning, they did also use it as a reference guide and as a resource. And they would bring up some of those information um, that was available on it to be able to work with when any of the clients came in and the people who, and the patients that would come in to use it. Um, the learners get a certificate and they get actually CPD points, which was really awesome to be able to do that. Uh, and been working with all the councils and associations and the objective, of course, was the improved service delivery that they learned about all these new and improved key concepts in HIV, TB, and maternal and newborn health. Uh, the project is currently its final year. It's actually winding up in the next few months. Um, so they covered, there's actually, this is a problem, of course, with projects, which is what I, part of what we want to talk about here, is there's 118 districts. The project only got to five different districts, and they were able to reach 600 um, providers um, within the project. But then when you think about, okay, now they've released 5,000 uh, people on the actual platform now, which I know has been increased tremendously in the last couple of months, more so with COVID. So I'm sure there's probably close to 7,000 people, um, but it's just being able to keep expanding upon that and, and building upon it. Um, so that's been really great to see. So as part of transitioning, as part of scaling, and part of this engineering at all, um, how is the ministry gonna be able to take it over? So there is being um, a unit being more formed where um, the health desk would be there um, and people to actually kind of keep, keep moving it, make it, move it forward than anything else. The other interesting aspect is for the certificate certification of it, they're working with like the national health councils um, for nursing and midwife and health providers um, to be able to, our favorite word, interoperable um, from the learning platform to these councils to actually receive all the accreditation. Um, so again, thinking about, okay, how do we bring it forward? How do we scale in different ways? 
Um, in terms of the data side, I um, had introduced to them XAPI like four or well, five years ago now. We were actually one of the first cohorts of Megan Torrance's XAPI cohorts um, to actually figure out how to bring XAPI into um, bringing together the data from the e-learning and the data from other ways that they were monitoring the performance and they did a clinical assessment. They could use health data from the providers um, at the, the, the sites themselves. Um, so didn't quite get there, but have slowly had tried to make that introduction, um, but they weren't quite ready for it all. Uh, so this is just, again, bringing it all together. Um, and, you know, it's just been great over the five years that they've um, been able to take this whole process working, you know, with a couple of courses, a few districts, a few people and being able to scale it at that level. Um, and because it was already in place, it's been a little bit easier, not completely easier to, to continue to make these courses and stuff available. Other partners in the country are interested in it. Um, other, some pre-service education institutes, the training institutes um, that do pre-service education have asked for the courses. Um, so all these you know, different areas that are building it up to make sure it reaches areas that we might not know to. So across the whole country, um, being able to scale that. Um, Thank you. That's what I have to share. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, um, we, we should have like a low tech solution, also a high tech solution. So when we uh, constrain resources and technology, I think Jody is the, the expert. I, I had been running an assessment company for uh, 25 years or so, and it was a worldwide company and I traveled to many countries of the world. And uh, the assessment company focused on uh, knowledge and skills or functional skills. Um, as a CEO, I also had to understand behaviors and emotional intelligence and, and uh, situation psychological safety. But I, I, I always struggled to put it together in a way that I could explain it easily to people. So uh, I stepped down from that role about 18 months ago and try and produce a model a bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs or, or another model that would help um, leaders especially, but anyone who's interested, understand the difference between mindset and skill set and what supports uh, behaviors, what supports capabilities in order to perform. And, and we saw this, or I saw this, uh, uh, specifically important in the age of digital transformation and in the fourth industrial revolution, because uh, what we see is that the, the skills being taught in schools and colleges might not be all the skills that we need in the workplace. So uh, in your introduction, uh, Jesse and others uh, have talked uh, and inferred about specialization. Well, uh, as we have all these support tools that enable specialization, we still have to get along with others. We have to communicate with others. We know the advantages of diversity, uh, diversity of thought, diversity of background, etc. And uh, the challenge is that there might be kind of conflicts. So how do we resolve conflicts? How do we develop these intelligences? So I started this quest, as I say, about 18 months ago, and I just went to all my friends who were uh, either CEOs of businesses or in uh, uh, L&D teams or HR teams and started developing a model. And it started out as Venn diagrams and swim lane diagrams and and eventually we started settling on a, a model, which was uh, we now call the, the talent transformation pyramid. And it's really to promote this understanding. And I'll show it to you in a moment. Uh, I'm, I'm very conscious of time, Jesse, so I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to try and not use all my, my, my minutes here so that uh, we, we, you can uh, complete with others. But I'll give you a little flavor of that. But then uh, after we produced that, I, I started realizing this, uh, the, the power of having a method for the workplace to communicate to education the 21st century skills that they would need. Cooperation, collaboration, conflict resolution, creativity, innovation, all of those kind of things. And part of it was sparked uh, here in Miami, where I live, uh, by a friend of mine who runs an architectural firm. He has 150 architects that designs creative spaces for schools and education institutions. And he said, I take in architects and it takes me about two years 
for them to really become productive because they're not learning some of the key skills I need in my archi archi architectural firm. And it was, uh, you know, a big uh, bell went off and said, you know, what's the problem here? Part of the problem is that the workplace struggles to communicate about the 21st century skills that it needed. So I got involved and really involved in the IEEE's uh, competency data model, because I felt if, if the workplace could document these competencies, they could then provide that to education and vice versa. It would be a free flowing, a more free flowing market of talent uh, across these domains. Um, I worked with uh, Jim uh, Goodall and some other folks there and um, they, the trouble when you get too interested and too passionate and, and, and too involved, uh, they give you your own chairmanship. So I now am just starting uh, to chair a group on the uh, best practices or recommended practices for developing competences. So the kickoff meeting for that will be in uh, September 28th. We're just kind of crossing some T's and dotting some I's. But if you're interested in competency definitions and how it can drive curricular education, micro-credentialing assessments, uh, 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 um, job descriptions, job ads, or anything like that, you know, it'd be great to have you involved, at least an, as a, an observer, but a participant and an active participant would be great. So with that, um, uh, I, I want to now just quickly switch to the model. And uh, so the model looks like this. Uh, 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 Jesse, can you see the screen okay? Yes. Fantastic. So um, as a CEO, you're generally worried about outcomes um, or any organization is worried about outcomes. What is the data that tells you you succeeded? So you need to define that to begin with, and then you want to see how you compare with it. So that's one thing, but it's kind of looking in the rearview mirror. In the, you need to say, are you ready to perform? So what is it that drives readiness? Well, it's things like mission, vision, uh, values, culture, uh, it's project planning, competitive analysis, SWOT analysis. So that is dealt really well in other places. So I'm, I'm not gonna labor on that, but it is a part of being ready is having the right talent and competencies in place, which, so, Competence here is supporting readiness. This is about talent. It's uh, not about every other aspect of running a business, but so competence is, so competence is partly is defining the kind of competences you want, hence my involvement with the IEEE, and uh, recognizing competences. Clearly I've come from a, an assessment background, credentialing, uh, certifications. We div delivered 20 million exams a year, so uh, got a little bit involved in that. And that's then kind of splits. In competencies, we have behaviors. How do we want people to behave on the job? And what are their capabilities? What are they capable of doing? Now, their behaviors depend upon the situation, the psychological safety, the incentives. Um, so we might have a really good uh, person, but behaves badly because they're not provided the right psychological safety. Uh, they're not encouraged to perform. They're not encouraged to be innovative or creative, um, or they're incentivized. We saw that with the uh, with Wells Fargo Bank that we had people that were they knew what to do, but their incentives encouraged them to do bad things. So, uh, and then what supports behaviors? Not only the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, but also our level of social and emotional intelligence that we learn, and then our underlying personality traits and motives and uh, et cetera. So on the left there, that's kind of the mindset. On the right is our skill set. So this is capabilities. Are we capable of performing a task? Uh, and what, what uh, uh, enhances our capability is the environment. So uh, there's these guide on the side, and I know I'm uh, devaluing the, the sophistication of augmented reality, but if I have tools and information, I can be more capable uh, on the job. Um, so that's kind of the environment, tools, information, but also uh, the wind, the rain, the heat, the cold, uh, the smells, etc., will affect how we perform. And then underpinning that, of course, is the skills that we've learned, and then our cognitive and physical ability. So that's it, the, the model. 
Um, it has a few more uh, kind of depth of sophistication than, than the things we were trying to model, like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But we're finding it's really resonating with people, especially those that are trying to understand competence is what helps someone be competent. Well, it's that combination of uh, uh, encouraging the right behaviors and encouraging the right capabilities. So with that, Jesse, I'm going to hand back to, to you and your, and your fellow presenters, because uh, I, I think um, uh, I've um, hopefully uh, helped to promote some understanding. Thank you. Fantastic presentations. A really, uh, I, I gleaned a lot from everyone. I'm sorry I missed the first one, though, uh, just because of my late log on, but fantastic presentations. The intersection of technology and behavior, especially in the last gentleman's presentation, is really kind of the key focus that I pulled out of this, or the key components that I pulled out of this, is how do we leverage the right level of technology in the intersection of human behavior to really move the needle on performance, right? So I, I mean, that my feedback is really there's something I got out of every presentation that was because each one was more human centered than technology centered, but leveraged technology in the right capacity to sort of drive effective measurement and ability around human performance. So that's great. Because awesome. the pandemic, pandemic has changed almost everything. It just um, unprecedentedly changed the way people people learning. So mm -hmm. everybody has to learn, no matter if they want or not. They have mm -hmm. to learn how to work remotely, how to how to learn remotely. Mm -hmm. And um, by doing that, so it has increased a huge market. For example, uh, Zoom. Uh, so Cybernard is Zoom's angel investor. Mm -hmm. So we we have enjoyed the the large growth. Uh, of users for, 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 and also in China, you can see that during the pandemic, uh, Ding Ding, uh, which is owned by, by, by Alibaba. Mm -hmm. So Ding Ding's users has increased to, I think, uh, has increased to 300 million people. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's huge, right? And in the past, it, it, Ding Ding only has like 20 million people before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, it, it has, it, it has been seeing that, that huge in, uh, increase of, of the users. So um, since then we decided uh, we will be looking at uh, the next Zoom mm. broadly. So, this kind of um, learning platform is one of our area of interest. Mm -hmm. And also we're looking at tools to help organizations, education companies, ad tech companies, and the schools and the universities to easily transform to the digital world. Mm -hmm. Because from the, dem the pandemic, we clearly see that almost at least in China, 90% of the people, 90% of the users or the instructors, they are unable to digitalize their content mm -hmm. or not do that easily because they are not used to that. So mm -hmm. the second area uh, we are looking at is, is tools. To tools. help those organizations, yes, tools. Tools, okay. Yeah. Yes, tools. Mm -hmm. To help those people, to help those people, no, no matter where they are, no matter they're in the organizations or in companies or in, in universities, colleges, and, and schools, to help them, you know, quickly and conveniently. Transfer the learning content. Yes, to help them, to help them create digital content. Yes. And to use those content to do their instructions. Yes. And the third area that we are looking at uh, is those ad tech companies, which are already in this, in, in this area. Mm -hmm. For 
for example, uh, Jesse and I, we talked about uh, edX and um, and the Coursera this afternoon, um, several several hours ago, I think, eight hours mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. So we believe uh, online education with bachelor degrees and with um, with master degrees or with certificates and with micro uh, credentials that will be the future because. Uh, in the past, before the pandemic, people used to, people are used to go to campus. I mean, most of the students, right? So it is just a habit. But during the pandemic, they have to, they have to change their habits. And by doing that, by remote learning, people started to think about if it is necessary to really go to the real campus, if yeah. there is another... I, I'm aware that today's startup is not having the most resources in the world. There are bigger companies doing similar things, but startups is where you have opportunity to participate and to have some um, control from, from investors' perspective. So uh, I agree with you. Yes, mobile and AR, VR, yes, these are the future. Mm. I, I will say uh, in that area, yes, because you need a lot of money to do the research, the prototype before you really get those products in the factories. So it, you, you need to um, either raise a lot of money or you need to, you need to get supported maybe yes. by you know, a certain giant technology company. Yes. So uh, we are trying to um, connect these like, uh, startups with uh, resources they need to grow. Uh, it's really exciting to learn so many different perspectives and what people are doing um, from tonight's panelists. I think it's very, very effective. And so that we can exchange our different uh, perspective and what we are doing differently so that we can connect and maybe have some, yeah something to work together with in the future.